Okay, and now the Amberson Lecture. So the Amberson Lecture recognizes major lifetime contributions to clinical or basic research that have advanced our fundamental understanding of basic translational or clinical approaches to respiratory diseases, critical illness, or sleep disorders. This award also recognizes exemplary professionalism, collegiality, and citizenship through mentorship and leadership in the ATS community. The lecture is given in honor of James Burns Amberson, an international authority on chest diseases and tuberculosis. This year's Amberson lecture is Dr. Naftali Kaminsky, Professor of Medicine in the Department of Internal Medicine and the Section Chief of Pulmonary Critical Care and Sleep Medicine at Yale University. Dr. Kaminsky is a prolific researcher who has, who has used cutting edge omic technologies to unravel the mystery of the human genome to gain mechanistic insights into the pathogenesis of chronic lung diseases with a particular focus on IPF as well as COPD and asthma. Now, in, in addition to his scientific contributions, Dr. Kaminsky stands out because of his willingness to collaborate and share data and share resources. And his generous spirit has made him such a wonderful and, and desired collaborator to teams around the world, and he has helped launch the careers of many junior investigators. He also takes his role as mentor very seriously and has worked to increase uh, the diversity in our field. He has received numerous honors and awards for his research and mentorship over the years and has held many leadership roles within ATS. I am sure his family is just felling right now. Um, and so please join me in welcoming today's Amberson lecturer, my friend and colleague, Dr. Naftali Kaminsky. So thank you for this honor. This is a, an amazing honor. Um, I'll basically start, and as you see the faces of all the people in my section, I start by mentioning the fact that as an honoree, I'm only a representative. Because all of the work I'll mention, all the successes, is actually the work of other people. And especially the people, the sort of the people who were in my lab over the years, they are the real awardees, unsung heroes, and this should be our approach that the person who gets the award is really merely a messenger of the excellence of so many others. Uh, this is a disclosure of my financial uh, list. Uh, the reason I put it here is that remember, as physicians, scientists, researchers, educators, we have to collaborate with industry. We have to consult industry. This is the way that we get our medicine to patients. Um, I want to start with the people who made it possible for me to be here today. Now, I mean literally, because Friday I had a severe back pain. And basically, I was going to faint in the lobby at the Marriott. I was actually fainting. And Alison Morris and Joyce Lee noticed me and basically put me in a wheelchair, forced me to go to the emergency room in UCSF, and saved my life. So. Thank you, Alison. Thank you, Joyce. So I'll speak a little bit about it myself. And basically, I'll speak about my beginnings. This is where I was born, Haifa, on the coast of the Mediterranean. Really beautiful sky, blue sky and sea. But actually, my beginning was not so clear. This is the only photo that we have of my father's family, of his sisters. Rachel died of pneumonia. Hinda was murdered. His brother Yaakov, his parents, Tova and Naftali, and almost everybody else he knew died. After World War II, my father arrived to Israel, married my mother, became a soldier, then a dissident, then a political exile. I'm named after his father, my sister after his mother. This is a photo of my mother. She was more fortunate. At the age of seven, at first grade, she became a child refugee. She, her parents, and three of her aunts survived. Everybody else that she knew before then died or was murdered. 
After World War II, my mother arrived to Israel, married my father, worked as a seamstress and a sales clerk in the department store. She never studied. She had two years of schooling overall. She still spoke seven uh, years of uh, seven languages and got two kids uh, through university. This photo is of her at the age of 13. You see her smile. This is despite of all the horrible stuff she saw. And she never stopped smiling until her last day. This is a painting of my parents' wedding that was done actually by my youngest daughter, Ayelet. And they actually separated. I never saw, remember them together. They separated when I was seven years old. They lived on different continents, never met again. But they taught me actually the exact same lesson. And this is what I carry, which is if one day you find yourself among the privileged, Remember where you came from. Support the sick, the poor, the dispossessed, the disadvantaged, the excluded, the harassed, the oppressed. Because for us, it's personal. Members of our family were killed because of racism and hate, because of ignorance, poverty, because of indifference. And do not forget, we were saved because strangers helpers. Also, do not forget, in the specific case of us, that our salvation was the disaster of others. And when you see me standing here, I am the product of both the disaster of the Jews and the disasters of the Palestinians. And I can never forget that in every moment of my life. And this drives my commitment. So as a physician scientist, I feel advocating for climate action, gun control, clean air, health care, vaccines is not politics. It is our professional duty. As a son to refugees, supporting the poor and the dispossessed is my duty. I hope all of you will share this vision and maybe I inspire you to continue being active for that. So this is a photo. So interestingly, we're also on our 40th year of being married. So this is a photo of me and Iris. And basically, as I told her, with my life story, I have to go to med school because I need to cure all the people who died before I was born. Her answer was very simple. I'm okay with that as long as you do not stop cooking and washing the dishes. <laughs> and I did not. So we have an amazing family. I yell it, uh, Tamar, Nomi, my wife. But really, nothing that I did. We are a team. You see this handshake. This is what we have. We are. And really, thank you, Iris. So initially, I thought I will acknowledge everybody that helped me. And then I realized that basically, we need a whole conference just for that. But I'll mention sort of early people, Isahar Ben Dov and Mayor Brezis and Verdi Alom and Dore Chalham and Rafi Breuer. They were my inspiration when I was a resident and thought that the case report was really the most important thing I could do. And I did some really cool ones. I'm very proud of them. And then I went to, to sort of actually came to an ATS conference. Um, heard Jeff Whitsitt give the Amberson Award and said, I want to do science. I met with Dean Shepard, he accepted to his lab, and really that started my career. So Dean Shepard, uh, Renu Heller, who taught me genomics, Moises Selman and Annie Pardo, who taught me actually pulmonary fibrosis. These were the people who made me a person who does research. Augustine Choi that recruited me out of Israel and gave me unbelievable resources to success and sort of the A-team of the Simmons Center, Kathy Lindell, Kevin Gibson, Jim Dauber, Mary Williams. These are amazing. And then many others, Lynn Tanui, Patty Lee, Jack Elias, Gary Desir, Sally Wenzel, Mark Gladwin. This is our, my leadership education team. And I'm sure many of us have them. And then there's many other people. I cannot really mention every single person, but really this is an amazing team. Careers are never built on a single person. People say it takes a village. I would say it takes a huge conference room, like the ATS. So idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis is a disease I study. You don't need an introduction. I'll say one thing. I was always fascinated by the lesion of the disease, the pathological UAP pattern on biopsy, this myofibrobus foci with the epithelial cells lining it, and really wanted to study it. So, my first version of charting the roadmap to curing LPF 1.0 was by doing, taking lungs, whatever the technology was, grinding them and profiling them. And at that time when I started, uh, 
the paradigms of pulmonary fibrosis was that it was stable and variably progressive disease, uh, inflammatory response leading to fibrosis, disease defined by fibroblast proliferation. And the notion was that it's a boring disease. The lung is just a fibrotic sac, and you can never reverse fibrosis. You just need to suppress inflammation. So the cool thing that we learned is all of this stuff was wrong. And actually, one of the things that I learned in my career that every time a man who is accomplished says something with utter confidence, they're usually wrong, <laughs> including this statement, by the way. <laughs> so this is sort of my first work. We took a few. This was collaboration with Roche, Renu Heller, again, uh, Annie and Moises, uh, profiled a few IPF lungs uh, using a limited technology at the time. And we, the, the one thing that struck us, the fibrotic lung was highly active transcriptionally. This was not a dead sac. And there was the relative lack of traditional inflammation. Actually, anybody that would have looked at our data would have stopped giving inflammatory drugs to patients. There was a change in epithelial cell phenotype and the role of MMP7. Over the years, we did many more. This is a heat map. Every row is a gene. Every column is a patient. This is the sentence that I say every talk, and I never get tired of it. Yellow is increased. Purple is decreased. And you don't need to be an expert to see how different IPF is. And there's genes that go up and down, and we've studied the mechanism. There's more than 100 mechanistically relevant genes. And really, so many scientific insights, right? This is like unbelievable, really rich data. But did it really get us closer to therapies? So one is probably not. <laughs> but there is actually some cool stuff that emerged over the years, at least in my lab. One is the discovery of the role of microRNAs in pulmonary fibrosis. And basically, we saw that MIR-29 was decreased in the lungs of patients with pulmonary fibrosis, and then through a collaboration with Mergen, basically started a whole big study that led to the development of a microRNA mimic that you could give and inject subcutaneously and reverse fibrosis, in mice, of course. And we did a lot of work to get it done, and basically, uh, in vivo, we know that MIR-29 reverses fibroblast phenotypes. In vivo, it affects rodents. Actually, when you give it to humans, you can slow down keloid formation. And we know that low blood levels predict mortality. We also showed it in other methods. And again, this is the work of Guyin Yu and Rusty Montgomery and Farid Angari and Ashello Orleon and Mauricio Chocoli, and also with collaboration with Gisley Jenkins and, uh, 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 and Jose Razomadio. So as always, it's a lot of people. In another study, we looked at gene expression data, and Goyin Yu in my lab really was concerned, why is the enzyme that um, changes T4 to T3 increased in, in the IPF lung? And together with our gears to flacus, they did a Herculean study. This is the kind of study that I would never have the courage to write a grant on, because reviewers were said, too ambitious. And basically what they showed was a thyroid hormone through its effect on mitochondrial function reverse pulmonary fibrosis in animal models of disease. Now, unfortunately, we cannot really give thyroid hormone to patients with pulmonary fibrosis because of the toxicities. So we develop another approach using a molecule that is basically an orally available small molecule thyroid hormone receptor beta agonist that has no effect on the heart or on the gut. This is the work of Milica Vukmirovic and Farida Angari and Thomas Barnthaler and Susie Ding and K. Diane Rose and Maurice Chocoli and basically build the case, the same thing, that this could be a drug. And maybe this will be tested in humans uh, uh, eventually. And if you want to see the oral uh, presentation by Thomas Barnthaler, it's you can lift your phone, scan the QR code. It's a great talk. And it's not only that. Um, Greg Downey, through his collaboration with Joel Dudley and, uh, and others, uh, uh, and Leslie Cousins, basically looked at gene expression signatures of tyrosine kinases that would be good. And they actually looked at gene expression data that, uh, that suggested that sarcatinib, a SARC inhibitor, may be a better IPF drug. And Greg wrote this amazing grant that I was a collaborator with and, and uh, Joel, and we got funded to both do the preclinical work and the clinical work. And there's a clinical trial now after three years from the initial, actually now it's five, from the initial reservation, collaboration of Mount Sinai, Yale, and uh, uh, National Jewish with Maria Padilla, Daniela Antinozarkins, and more recently, uh, Susan Matai joined us. And really, we have a case for repurposing sarcatinib and IPF 
which comes all out of gene expression data, in vitro antifibrotic effect, in vivo, ex vivo, and there's a clinical phase. And again, if you want to help us recruit patients because we're behind because of COVID, raise your phone, look at the QR code, and refer the patients. So really, there's a lot of stuff. And what's amazing is, think about it. We all did all this, did all this cool stuff without actually knowing which cells we're looking at. And in many cases, our presumptions about where is the cell are actually wrong. So luckily, we can start charting the roadmap to curing pulmonary fibrosis uh, 2.0 at single cell resolution profiling. And the emergence of single cell resolution technology has been amazing. These are sort of several of the papers that studied pulmonary fibrosis. I'll focus on our work, basically. This is the work of Taylor Adams and Jonas Schupp and Neil Neumark and Zitin Yan and uh, Farida Angari in my lab in collaboration with Ivan Rosas and his team. And basically, we profiled IPF lungs. And what happens is, the moment we looked at the data, it was clear to me, this data is bigger than any one of us. So we need to share it publicly. And we posted this data in the IPF cell atlas, basically a highly usable uh, uh, data sharing format. And you, could, you don't need to do no computational biology. You actually don't need to do even anything, no anything about fibrosis. You could look at your favorite gene. And what's amazing was the success of this thing. We had 9,500 unique users from 50, 56 con countries, five continents since inception. They queried 15,000 genes, 314,000 gene searches. This is really, I think, the most successful IPA awareness campaign we ever did. And if you look at the sort of the, the word cloud, you can see the genes that people search most, and you'll see ACE2, which is because of COVID, people were searching. But you can see, and actually, uh, Carlos Cosmo is going to start an MD PhD in Pittsburgh this year, and uh, just, uh, Jasper Flint have a poster that are presenting actually the analysis of what are people searching. And I think this could help some companies think what's important in pulmonary fibrosis. So what did we find? This is an image of the data. You can never look at the data here. Every dot is basically a cell. We have to clean up the data. Uh, uh, and then we put cells that look next similarly next to each other, and then we assign annotations. And on the right, you can see we color the cells based on the disease. So red is pulmonary fibrosis, yellow is COPD, and blue is control. And again, you don't need to be a bioinformatician to see that IPF is really different. And you have these red bulges of cells that show up only in disease. The first thing that we saw was the dramatic shift in epithelial component of the lung. Basically, the alveolar lung, the distal lung, loses the alveolar type 1 cell. As you all know, the lung exists for the alveolar type 1. That's where gas exchange happens. Everything else is service. You bring the air in the tubes, you secrete surfactant, you need the alveolar type 1. And basically, we lose alveolar type 1, we lose this alveolar type 2, the cell that actually do the maintenance of the alveolus. And this is just an image, and think about it. If you now replace the area that gas exchange happens with something that cannot do gas exchange, how are you going to breathe? And this sort of starts changing the way we think about pulmonary fibrosis. And then we also described a, an epithelial cell population that was never described before. And this was really interesting. There is a notion in our community that you describe cells based on markers. The way I look at it, it's a little bit like if you would define a physician based on wearing a white coat or if you define an athlete based on wearing sneakers. So what happens when the physician takes off their white coat? Do they stop being a physician? When they put sneakers, do they become an athlete? So there is a problem. We need to think about functions and signatures and about context. So what are these cells? Basically, they're really interesting because they have markers of basal cells. They are P63 and keratin-17 positive, but keratin-5 negative. They have markers of epithelial mesenchymal transition. So epithelial cells that express collagen 1 and then cadherin. They can activate TGF-beta, the most prophibotic cytokine. They're actually carrying the machinery to drive fibrosis, the integrin alpha V-beta 6 that the, uh, my mentor Dean Shepard discovered. They are semi-senescent. They have some stemness markers. And they also carry that biomarker that I discovered 20 years ago, MMP7 and may suggest, let's say, we can 
based on the blood levels of MF7, where be, maybe we know what's happening to aberrant basalite cells. And also, you know, MMP7 is the best biomarker for outcome prediction in IPF, and this is just a reminder of the work done by Argiris Souflakis. And when you look at them, when you stain for them, these cells are actually the cells that are at the epithelial cells of the edge of the myofibrous foci. So they are at the core active lesion of pulmonary fibrosis. And they have stemness, they have TG bed activation, senescence, EMT, MMP7. They are the Swiss army knife of fibrosis and should be targeted. Um, of course, when you discover something, you always go to the literature and you say, okay, people saw it 20 years ago. And uh, Marco Carlosi and Venerino Pilotti published uh, uh, work consistent with this in 2002. And uh, Zia Borok showed this, uh, uh, the persistence of cells with uh, epithelial mesenchymal features in the IPF lung. And Antje Prasse more recently showed similar things. So this is not something. And then we found it also in the work of, uh, uh, on the data from Sasha Misharin and Bob Valfiatis and of course Nick Banovich and uh, John Kropsky that actually distinguished exactly the same thing that we distinguish simultaneously. But now we can do other things. So this is a project with uh, 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 our amazing collaborators at Leuven, Winvites, in which we can start looking at differentially affected regions in the same lung, and we quantify the fibrosis with um, uh, high, uh, micro CT. So we identify, we could do uh, 10 IPF lungs in every lung, different areas, and then we identify all the known cell types, but now we're getting better resolution. And there is a poster again being showed on May 17th by Jonas Schub that shows the result. But I'll show you a couple of things. One is how dependent we are in our measures. So if you look at single cell dissociated data, you get a lot of macrophages. Actually, 80% of the cells you get are immune cells. But we all know that the lung is not a lymph node or a granuloma. And if you look at the nuclear, single nuclear data, we get actually data that is very similar to lung morphometry, so much more normal. The other thing, we can get much better resolution, and this is looking at 150,000 epithelial cells, and suddenly we start seeing really cool, things. Well, one is we can confirm now that there is a population of cells that are not alveolar type one and are not alveolar type two in the IPF lung. They're only in the IPF lung, you never see them in normal. And they have multiple features, and some of them have been described by others, some of them parallel to what's described by others, but others don't. And then the aberrant basal cells are sort of this independent blob. And then there's a lot of basal cells, and potentially a small group of cells in the middle. And there's a bunch of markers. It's beyond the detail that you need for this talk. Just enjoy the images. Um, <clears throat> the other thing is that we could just quantify, now that we have differentially affected lungs, we can see what happens first, and it definitely looks like the loss of alveolar type 1 cells happens relatively early when the disease is not at least fully developed in the IPF lung. The other thing is um, Sam Reredon, a brilliant MD-PhD student at Yale that's now going to be a postdoc in my lab, actually, uh, looked at basically conserved ligand receptor networks. And what he saw was that it looks like that in the normal lung, and he analyzed uh, rats and pigs and humans and mice, basically it's the alveolar type one cell that connects with all the cells. So although we used to think about this cell as the cell that sits and does nothing, this cell sits and does nothing, but it tells other cells, one is, I'm okay, I'm alive, we can breathe. And it also tells them, this is the stuff I get to keep breathing. But what happens in the IPF lung, and this is the work by uh, Nia Kotopali, an undergrad at Yale, is uh, this image didn't translate well, I'm sorry, is basically that the aberrant basalite cells are stealing much of the uh, uh, lung homostatic signal. And it starts, you start asking, what is this process is, the, is happening and what is the regulation? There's other things that we found Non-alveolar and the tibial cells are the same thing, are in found in the lung parenchyma. So we lose the aerocytes, the soulmate of the alveolar type 1 cell. We lose it, and instead we get um, 
Uh, and we lose also the general capillary, and instead we get infiltration of venous capillary cells. So the same thing, you replace the cells that adapted to do gas exchange with cells that cannot do gas exchange. What about macrophage and fibroblasts? I will not go in too much detail. Maybe you should ask somebody else. But I'll just say one thing is, one is macrophages, there's definitely profibrotic macrophages in the IPF lung. That's been shown, multiple data. They're clear, clearly therapeutic targets. When we look at fibroblasts, and this is again moving from this idea of uh, identifying a cell biomarker, starting to think about function, through a collaboration with Miri Adler, a brilliant postdoc of Aviv Regerfeld and Ruslan Mechitov, uh, basically what she does, she takes the data and applies pareotherapy on scarcity of function. And basically a non, a generalist, a cell that generalist is gonna be in the middle and a cell that specializes is gonna be at, at an age based on archetype analysis. And what she showed was very cool, in the normal lung, Fibroblasts have like five archetypes, contractile, ECM production, protein biosynthesis, degradation, and regulation. But then the IPF lung, they basically zoom into three archetypes. One is contractile, the other one is collagen uh, production, and the third is actually regulation of immunity, which may suggest that part of the role of fibroblasts is responding to the immune signaling and uh, or potentially recruiting the immune cells that are coming in the IPF. So we're back to this lesion that fascinated me from the first time I saw it on a slide, the sort of the IPF lung with the myofibroblast fossa. And basically what's happening behind it? So we have a cartoon of the lung, now more advice with more detail, uh, done by Arnaud Melier. And what happens is that we do get death of alveolar type one cells, and I think there is some replacement. But now, when we look deeper, you have alveolar type two cells that have a genetic predisposition, potentially shorter telomeres, potentially this recent report of uh, abnormal zinc metabolism. They cannot do what they were supposed to do. And while their aspiration is, become, is to become an alveolar type one cell, they have several options. One is some of them die, some of them basically fail. The mitochondrial dysfunction, they release dumps, they activate the environment, and then several probably get stunted or de-differentiated in a wide variety of uh, intermediate states, as well as the upper end basalite cells. And now you get fibroblast activation, stiffening of the matrix, potentially this contractile phenotype of fibroblast starting to impinge, pushing, you get the airway, airway remodeling, you get the recruitment of the venous systemic endothelial cells, and you are in a usual interstitial pneumonitis histological pattern or IPF. So here's the cool thing. Now we start knowing what we should target and intervene to actually reverse this process because there's multiple spots that we can do stuff to. But the question is, how do we do it? So, and the other question is, can we move faster? And I always go to the dude with a side when I want to highlight something. So how do we move faster? We need better drugs now. And my approach is we need to use our data to create a digital twin of the fibrotic lung, a simulator that will allow cell-specific response to perturbations. So that's the roadmap, and that will be my last three slides. Charting the roadmap to curing pulmonary fibrosis 3.0, and basically using our profiling data uh, uh, and uh, artificial intelligence to really get new drugs. So basically this is a project in which we both generate signatures of drugs apply computational methods and our ideas to identify computationally uh, uh, and predict the activity of compounds that reverse fibrotic changes in more than one cell type, normalize cellular interactions, affect the emergence of fibrosis, affect the progression of fibrosis, enhance recovery or regeneration, protect gas exchange units, and be devoid of adverse effects. And I'm glad to say that this is funded by uh, Three Lakes uh, uh, Foundation, and uh, I'm sort of, there's multiple collaborators, but me and uh, uh, Mel Melanie Connex have a leading this effort. So paradigms of idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis 2022. One is I'm gonna put the loss of respiratory unit up front. Our patients die of low DLCO, not of FEC. 
so for the pulmonologists in the audience. The f then this is happening probably because of failure of local progenitor repair and activation of aberrant regeneration. And this is manifested by this proximalization of the distal lung with centrality of aberrant basalite cells, systemic vascular and endothelial cells, shift in archetypes of alveolar fibroblasts and recruitment of prophagotic macrophages. And we have multiple steps now that can be inhibited. Development of cell-specific diagnostics, development of, we could do development of curative therapies, disruption of disease-promoting networks and cell-specific therapies. And the main thing, we now are having, are having the data that will allow them to generate a digital twin of the IPF lung to simulate effects of perturbations and accelerate drug implementation. So I always stop, finish my talks with this slide. It's my, one of my favorite slides. This is basically Diane Reichardt, an IPF patient, started a campaign for IPF awareness, which was called Blue Up 4PF. Nobody paid attention to her, so we decided to pick it up. And we basically, one of our academic days in uh, Yale, we dedicated to Diane, she came over, we dyed our hair blue, and it was a really cool event and one of Diane's happiest days. Sadly, Diane died seven months afterwards, and uh, it was a strange and difficult event because she announced her decision to go on palliative care on Twitter to me. And this was one of these cases that you don't really know what to say, except Diane will support you with whatever you wish. But it's also, it left a will because she did want to live. And it is our duty to do everything. For us, it's not just an intellectual riddle. It is something that we need to do, solve pulmonary fibrosis. So all my talks are dedicated to pulmonary fibrosis warriors and to, of course, I'm grateful to people that fund the works. And this year, I do want to mention when I'm looking at this audience, I really want to dedicate this talk also to all the amazing pulmonary critical care sleep medicine teams all over the country because we did, you did save many lives in the last two years. And if we keep working, we'll save many more. Thank you all. Mazel tov. Stay here. I can Thank start. you, Naftali. Congratulations, a wonderful talk. Thanks. And we're so proud of you. Thank you. Okay. Woo.